my name is Carrie Rinker and today I'm going to be giving an overview of farm leases. For those of you that don't know me, I'm a food and agriculture lawyer uh, with the office located here in New York City at 44th and 5th Avenue. And some of you are probably wondering how in the world I am a food and agriculture lawyer in New York City. Well, I actually grew up in a beef cattle farm in central Illinois. I have undergraduate and even advanced degrees in agriculture and animal science um, before I even went to law school here um, at Pace Law School in White Plains, New York. I'm currently the chairperson of the American Bar Association General Practice Solo and Small Firm Divisions Agriculture Law Committee. Whew, that's a mouthful. We've got two webinars actually coming up this fall, one on insurance and another on intellectual property. I encourage the listeners here today that are interested in practicing um, agricultural law to please get in touch with me about involvement in that committee. My food and agriculture law practice is um, quite varied. I work with a lot of farmers and ranchers and also small to mid-sized agribusinesses and increasingly food entrepreneurs, so people making jams and jellies or people starting baby food companies. Um, um, food entrepreneurs is an exciting aspect of my practice. Today on farm leases, I'm gonna be talking about six main areas. I'm gonna be starting with general considerations, just what's happening right now in the world of farm leases. Active and passive income will be the second issue that I'll talk about, and some of you are probably wondering, what does that have to do with farm leases? I'll get to that in just a few minutes. Number three, the types of farm leases. There are three main types of farm leases, but a few spin-offs from that that I'm gonna be discussing major farm lease provisions. Um, fifth, I'm gonna be talking just briefly on price and rent negotiation, and then I'm gonna close with some other types of leases used on a farming operation. So let's start off with some general considerations. What's currently being done? Well, most farm leases are actually on a handshake. In fact, there were a few K-State studies that show that almost 50% of farm leases were with oral agreements. Now, those studies were done in Kansas, um, but that is indicative, I think, of what's happening um, coast to coast in the agriculture community, uh, community. The citation for that study is in the outline um, that's provided on your materials and um, it's also posted on my JDU Supra page, but it's on page one of my outline for the citation there. So for those of you that are lawyers here today um, that are listening, you're gonna get some pushback from your clients about having written farm leases. And for those of you that are farmers that are listening to this, then I'm speaking to you directly. So for the agricultural lawyers, um, here are some pointers that I think on trying to explain to your client on why they should have a written farm lease. Um, first of all, it provides a guide to the heirs for any landlord who wants to lease out the farmland. So what do I mean by that? Well, I'm an off-farm heir. My family has a farm in central Illinois. Fortunately for me, my brother is there next to my family farm, but let's say he moved to Colorado and later had no interest in the farm and something happened to my parents. And I have a lot of practice here in New York City. I don't know what, what life will lead for me. And perhaps at that time, if my parents had passed, I would want to run out the farmland. So that is an example here of you know a, a landlord owner who maybe does not want to be that involved in the farm. And the farm lease can be quite helpful. Second of all, it facilitates a conversation between the landlord and the tenant. So not only is it a negotiation um, tool, but I have found that it's a, a quality communication tool that desperately sometimes needs to happen between the landlord and the tenant. It provides a checklist, so to speak, for the landlord and the tenant to discuss the provisions of their lease. Um, third, it's more likely that the parties have read and understood the terms of the agreement. And this makes sense, right? So if a farmer actually looks at a written contract, they're more likely to understand and make sure that they have discussed the terms with their lawyer, if they don't have a lawyer, that they have worked through the issues themselves and really understand it. 
Um, whereas with oral contracts, these provisions could just be brushed over. Well, of course, that's inferred, right? Well, not necessarily, the, not necessarily so. Uh, perhaps most importantly, it clarifies important provisions. Maybe these are terms that aren't even discussed in the oral agreement, such as renewal terms, termination, profit sharing, um, if it's a crop share lease with the, with the landlord. These are important issues that need to be memorialized in the farm lease. Here are a few other advantages. It can clear up tax issues, you know, property tax, income tax, self-employment tax, special use evaluation for estate tax purposes. And for most states, it helps ensure enforceability. In New York, for example, under the statute of frauds, contracts that have to do with land need to be in writing if it's for more than one year. Okay, so if you've got a two-year agreement on a farm lease, uh, most states that will, if it's an oral agreement, will not be enforced under the statute of frauds, okay? And then finally, it provides a written record if a dispute later arises. Now, what are the client's concerns? I mean, the biggest one I have found is attorney's fees and costs. I've got a slide on my next point here towards the end of the presentation, but I'm going to go ahead and make it briefly now. Um, about two years ago, I did a survey among the agriculture community, mostly producers, some agribusiness owners, and some people in other professions like Extension. And about 65% of those survey takers stated that they preferred flat fees. Now, for those of you that are in private practice, um, maybe you can relate to my next statement, but I hate flat fees. I can't seem to get it right. I usually charge hourly fees, but I found with things like farm leases and these contracts um, in the agriculture community, I found are more appropriate to be on a flat fee basis, which tends to make my client happy. Um, for more information on that survey, I have a presentation listed on my slide share page. It is uh, named How to Start and Grow a Law Practice and specifically um, a slide 21 uh, talks about the flat fees versus the billable hour. Furthermore, for Lawline, I did a presentation called How to Start and Grow an Agricultural Law Practice. It was my very first presentation that I ever did for Lawline, and I briefly touch about on um, that issue here. So I recommend also looking at that presentation. Second of all, clients don't want written farm leases because they want flexibility. Well, the rebuttal to that is simple. Farm leases can be changed, they can be amended. Make sure that your farm leases allow uh, for that to happen. And then finally, clients are oftentimes concerned about preserving their relationship. Uh, the agriculture community is very close-knit. They're oftentimes doing business with friends, friends of family, and they think if they get a lawyer involved and get a big old fancy farm lease, that it's somehow going to hurt the relationship. For the lawyers that are listening on the call, I recommend explaining that if a dispute arises, the written farm lease could actually preserve the relationship because it establishes the written rules on what's gonna happen and so there's not, they're not fighting over um, oral agreement, um, oral terms to the contract. So I have found that it'd be quite the opposite, that putting contracts and leases in writing can help um, restore and preserve those uh, relationships. All right, let's talk about the issue of active versus passive income and why do we even care, okay? So, this was an issue that came to life for me a couple years ago. I got a phone call from a retired farmer who was concerned about Social Security, okay? Um, and let's think about Social Security. You must claim a certain number of credits under the Social Security system before receiving Social Security. Now, in this instance, my farmer client, he was, uh, basically retiring from being an active farmer, okay, and he was concerned because he didn't quite have enough um, Social Security credits and he was moving to the landlord um, part of his life where he was going to be collecting rent checks. 
but he still needed social security credits. So that was the issue that was presented to me. Um, so let's back up and what is the definition of somebody who is self-employed? Okay, so as a person is self-employed, if they carry on a trade or a business such as farming, farming is self-employment in good faith to make a profit. Okay, so self-employed persons are subject to self-employment tax, makes sense, and they receive, importantly, social security credits. But here's the question, is a landlord to a farm lease a farmer? Are they carrying on a farming operation for self-employment tax purposes? The general rule is no, they're not, okay? So that's where this is an issue in that particular farmer's perspective who called me, you know, um, if he was just going to sit back and collect the rent check, and we'll delve into that a little bit more later, that would not be considered being self-employed for um, Social Security uh, reasons. However, there's an exception, right, like with everything in the law. The exception is, is if that landlord materially participates in the production or the management of the agriculture um, operation. So that's, that's the crux here of what, what this is. And the careful draftsman should make sure that if this is an issue for the landlord farmer who's concerned about Social Security, that the farm lease should be drafted in a way where that person is materially participating. Now the IRS has provided a lot of detailed information on exactly what material participation means. And for those of you that are interested um, in some more information, there is the IRS, if you can see the citation on the slide, it's called the Farmer's Tax Guide, IRS Publication 225. Check that out. It's chock full of information. It discusses, among other things, this test. So in this test laid out by the Internal Revenue Service, the landlord must meet one of four different tests. He only needs to meet one, he or she only needs to meet one, okay? So let's go, for, let's go through these four tests. Here's the first one. In the first one, uh, the landlord has to meet a three out of the four. One, pay at least 50% of the direct cost for producing the crop or the livestock to furnish at least 50% of the tools, equipment, and livestock used in the production activities. Three, advise or consult the tenant in the farming or ranching activity. And you can see that one's a little bit more ambiguous, right, on just advisement and consultation. And then four, inspect the production activities periodically, okay? So he has to do, he or she has to do three out of those four, okay? So that's test one. Let's look at test two. It says, regularly and frequently takes part in important decision-making and management of the farm directly affecting the success of the operation. What seed is going to be planted? When are they planting? When are they harvesting? What type of equipment is going to be used? If it's a livestock operation, what's the breeding look like? Um, are there any personnel issues? So the farmer is not just sitting back and collecting a rent check. He or she is involved, okay? Test three, works 100 hours plus the landlord and LL, you know, if you're following along, is landlord, T is tenant, um, as my abbreviations on the slide. So works 100 hours, plus the landlord is directly connected to agriculture production over a period of five weeks or more. So me, sitting here in New York City, calling my family farm, talking to the tenant, would not satisfy this. I would physically need to be at my family's farm, you know, with the tenant, working with the tenant for, 100 hours plus, this stuff should be in the lease if you're wanting to use this test. And then four, the test four is looking at the big picture. The landlord is materially and significantly involved in the production of um, the farm commodities. And this fourth test I think is the most vague and ambiguous of the other four. So 
you know, I suggest if you're going to try to go through test four to see if you can, can also satisfy the provisions in another test as well. All right, let's talk about the major types of farm leases. There are three biggies. They are a cash rent lease, second, a crop share lease, and then third, a hybrid or a flexible lease. Now, well, as we discuss these three types of leases, in the back of our heads, let's be thinking about this active versus passive income issue again for those of us that might represent a landlord where Social Security is an important issue. Okay? So, type one, cash rent lease. It is what it sounds like. The landlord takes cash for rent, right? That's it. You pay the cash in a fixed dollar amount, um, either on a per acre or a whole farm basis. You know, usually it's on a whole farm basis from what I have seen. And it could be modified slightly depending on crop yield, but for the most part, this is a pretty fixed lease. The landlord is sitting back and collecting rent. Um, the landlord could be retired and living in Florida um, and not involved in the operation at all, or the landlord could be living right there um, and be somewhat involved. But regardless, the landlord is simply just collecting the rent. So what are some advantages here? So the landlord, doesn't have to worry about that much, right? He's not, he or she's not really involved in the decisions of the farm. There's less managerial labor. There's less administrative headache. Um, there's more predictable cash income on a monthly or an annual basis. There's less concern over the division of expenses and marketing, but some disadvantages, okay? So if you've got the landlord who's concerned about whether or not um, they're actively engaged in farming for self-employment tax. This is probably not the lease for them. The landlord may have a difficulty in getting paid if it's a flat, if it's a flat amount, because what if it's a bad year, bad crop year? Um, there may be more difficulty in determining the fair amount of cash rent that is acceptable for both of the parties and um, something that I'm just going to briefly touch upon in a few parts here within this presentation is that the landlord can't receive U.S. Department of Agriculture Farm Service Agencies, FSA, direct or countercyclical um, payments. So from the flip side, what if you're representing the tenant, as some of us uh, often do? Okay, so the advantages here are that the tenant has full autonomy. He or she's the boss, makes the decisions. They don't have to consult the landlord on, you know, what seed to plant and when. Um, the tenant doesn't have to divide any profits um, like you will need to under a crop share at least. We'll talk about that here in just a second. There's less capital tied up in land and um, the tenant doesn't have to share any federal farm program payments with the landlord. But on the downside, the tenant does have some increased risk with commodity um, price fluctuations. If the landlord terminates the lease um, with the tenant, then the tenant may have a difficulty finding new land um, in the same proximity, the same, same um, price point, so there's some risk there. And this is particularly a risk if there is a short-term lease, if that tenant is making any improvements to the land itself, like the soil or any uh, buildings on the land. Okay, big type of lease number two is cash, I'm um, sorry, crop share leases. All right, in this situation, the landlord will actually share part of the input cost. So both the tenant and the landlord have skin in the game. So along with sharing that input cost, they also share profits. And these can be divided, they can be divided 50-50, 25-75. Um, there is quite a bit of variation on the percentages here with the, the crop share. Um, so both farmers, both the landlord and the tenant, share risk and reward. All right, so what are some of the advantages? Well, if you are a farmer who's concerned about Social Security and you want to be, quote, actively engaged in farming, this might be the lease for you. 
And another advantage is that the tenant must share federal farm program payments with the landlord, meaning FSA direct or counter cyclical payments. Some disadvantages would be that there's some variable income here, right? Like um, you take, take just as much as the risk um, as you do with the, as the tenant does. So some advantages for the tenant with this is that the tenant gets to share the, um, the management with the landlord, okay? So this is great for a mentor-mentee relationship. All right, and there are also fewer operating monies that are required for the tenant because they're sharing those expenses with the landlord itself. Okay, so but some disadvantages for the tenant is that the tenant in this situation loses autonomy, okay? Um, and they're also sharing profits, not only in, in bad years, but also in good years. So they can't quite reap that great reward um, if uh, there's a good year. Moving on to the slides, for those of you that are looking at my outline, livestock share leases are another type of crop share leases. They're just with, they're just with livestock, that's the only difference, okay? And we're back now, the slide is where we are here on the program. So in this situation, the landlord may own a portion of the, the livestock animals and share the burden of input costs just the same such as feed, for example, or vaccines or veterinary expenses, okay? So here the landlord and the tenant have skin in the game. The only difference here is that we're dealing with livestock versus crops. The third major type of farm lease is the hybrid or the flexible lease. In this type of lease, you kind of get the best of both worlds. There's a minimum flat fixed payment. And in addition to that, there is some sharing of profits and losses that are going on. Sometimes these are termed variable cash rent agreements, okay? And in this situation, if you remember the phone call that I received from the retired farmer who was um, worried about Social Security, he was particularly interested in this type of a farm lease and wanting to draft it in a way that he would still qualify for Social Security credits. All right, so what are some advantages to the landlord? So like that farmer who called me in this situation, depending on how it's drafted, okay, the landlord could be actively engaged in farming according to the IRS. Some disadvantages is that you know, there's still gonna be some variable income with, uh, with this, some increased financial risk. From the tenant side, the tenant is having not as much financial risk as they are with the crop share. So there's a little bit of a reduced financial risk. And there's reduced labor because the hope is, is that the landlord will be um, pitching in on here a little bit. And the disadvantages are, right, that the tenant doesn't have as much um, autonomy. All right, so now that we've gone through the different types of leases and we've got the active versus passive income issue down, let's talk about the farm lease itself. Let's go through the anatomy of the major farm lease provisions. All right, so number one, the parties. And this might seem straightforward, but I have found that this sometimes is not so straightforward. So we wanna identify who the landlord and the tenant is. I have actually had farmers call me and you know th the first question that I have for them, well, who's the landlord? And th they might say some names, and then, I, then my question for them is, well, does that person own the land with their wife or their spouse? Do they own it in a, in a trust? Do they own, own the land in an LLC? Who is actually the landlord here? Who are we dealing with? A lot of times in agriculture, there's DBAs. So a client might say a farm name to me, like for example, my family's farm is called Rinker Simitals, okay? So it's really Kurt and Pam doing business as um, Rinker Simitals, okay? There's no LLC, they're just a DBA. Um, and my own farm is Rinker Cattle Company, so I'm Carrie Rinker, DBA, Rinker Cattle Co. So get really clear on exactly who the landlord and the tenant is. 
and use the, the precise legal name in the lease, which might seem like common sense, but you'd be surprised how many clients don't really know who the landlord um, or the tenant's uh, legal name is. What's the purpose of the lease? Is it for crop production? Is there gonna be agritourism involved? Is there gonna be direct farm marketing, et cetera? All right, so the property description, not only include the address, I actually put the legal description of the property and ideally, if I can get it from my clients, a map of the property as an addendum or an exhibit to the farm lease. I like to include the FSA number if, if it's applicable. Um, I also on the farm lease um, as an exhibit have a list of the farm buildings and the structures that are applicable to the lease, like two barns, a silo, you know, go ahead and list those, those buildings out. And then is there going to be some farm machinery and vehicles that are subject to the lease? Sometimes there might be a tractor that kind of gets rolled into the whole farm lease as a whole. Enumerate that all out and I think attach it as an exhibit or an addendum, but it can be in the body of the lease too. The lease term should be clearly stated. Okay, so if the lease term is silent, it, it depends on the law in your state, then it's, but it's typically year to year will be the term that is inferred. But also check the law in your state on the length of the lease and whether or not it, um, the lease needs to be recorded. So for example, here in New York, where I am, if a lease is more than three years, then it needs to be a file with the county clerk. And this might be also a negotiation tool. Maybe you're dealing with clients who don't want their farm lease to become public record. Okay, so then in that situation, maybe the farm lease is two years long, two and a half years long, because they don't want it to be publicly recorded. Um, and some states actually have a maximum length of the farm uh, lease itself for the term. So check the law in your state with this. Usually, however, longer leases tend to be better for tenants. You think about somebody who comes in, a farmer tenant, perhaps they're growing crops, they're investing in the soil, they're trying to make the soil better. Um, a longer lease is going to behoove uh, the tenant client. All right, the lease should go into renewal terms. There should be specifics on uh, when, when does this uh, roll in? What are the provisions for the tenant giving the notice of the intent to renew? Um, does the, is there any agreed upon compensation for any fall field work completion if applicable upon the event of a non-renewal? These are some things that should be addressed in the lease um, as far as renewal is concerned. So importantly, you know, this is, we need to discuss payment, right? So with that in mind, the drafter or the reviewing lawyer should think, well, what type of a lease is this? Is it a cash rent, crop share, or a hybrid lease? What's the rent amount? What's, what are the payment instructions? Who is responsible for things like property taxes, insurance, utilities on the farm? What are the penalties, interest, and secure? Is there any security for any late payments? Is there a security deposit? Um, these things should be memorialized. A little bit about insurance, and I wanted to back up because at the beginning of this presentation, I stated that I'm the chairperson of the American Bar Association General Practice Solo and Small Firm Agricultural Law Committee. We have a webinar coming up on September 15th that's just focused on insurance, and I've also moderated um, a webinar for them on crop insurance if you're at all interested. But there are a lot of different types of insurance and what needs to be included and what the limit is is going to really vary by the type of client, where the client is, what type of operation, what is the value of the farm. These are, these, there are so many variables, okay? But, but essentially, there is going to be farm owners comprehensive liability policy. Um, perhaps there's commercial insurance. It depends on the operation. Um, if the farm is creating food products, like I have um, 
a farm client that likes to create pestos, okay? So um, that client needs to be thinking about products liability insurance or perhaps even food recall insurance. And what are the limits? Or do you need um an umbrella policy? Talk to your insurance broker um, to get some more information or have your clients talk about the insurance broker. As a general rule, I suggest to my clients that the insurance should be at least cover what the what the farming operation is valued at. So if the farm is, you know, worth one million, then they should have at least one million dollars of coverage. If the farm is worth two million, then there should be two million dollars of coverage. Who's paying for the insurance? Who's getting the insurance? This needs to be discussed and negotiated in the lease itself. All right, so what about reimbursement of expenses, especially if it is a crop share or a hybrid lease? In those two types of leases, the tenant may seek reimbursement for various input expenses like crop nutrients, lime, for example, or perhaps the tenant and the landlord have agreed upon certain improvements. Maybe there's an improvement to the barn or a fence line um, or other types of operational expenses. When is the landlord going to reimburse the tenant? Within 30 days? Within six months? What types of receipts does the tenant need to give to the landlord? Etc. All that should be laid out here. The next major type of um, section in the farm lease should talk about duties and prohibitions. Um, my outline on page 15, there's a nice checklist from the University of Vermont and I suggest a looking at that. But here are a few pointers. Um, maybe the lease will discuss any desired or prohibited farming practices, any maintenance requirements for the farm buildings or fences, including temporary structures, right? Maybe there are some temporary structures for chicken coops. Um, the, who's going to be, um, have a duty to control noxious weeds? or a brush, we've got some brush out in our pasture, my farm's um, pasture. What about soil conservation practices? The duty to make any improvements on the land, a requirement to reseed plowed fields, or can fertilizer, or how much fertilizer can be used on the property? A little bit more on this. Uh, when drafting this area, try to keep in mind the right to farm law um, to, to speak very briefly on this area, in New York, for example, and uh, most every state has its own right to farm law, so I encourage the attendees today to look at the right to farm law in your state. But in New York, an agriculture producer cannot be sued for nuisance if they are performing a sound agricultural practice within an agriculture district. All right, so back to farm leases. Well. The farm lease could state specifically that the entire farm property is in an agriculture district, okay? And the tenant could promise to do use sound agriculture practices as defined by the New York Agriculture and Markets Law on the farm property. So that would be one issue that could be memorialized in the farm lease that specifically deals with the right to farm law. Um, some leases also define good management practices. And I also like to have just a little clause in there that says that if livestock are involved, then the tenant has a duty to comply with farm animal welfare law at the federal, state, and local level. All right, so some other issues that might come up would be with certain activities that might be considered higher risk like agritourism, for example. Are there gonna be any hay rides, uh, corn mazes, any petting zoos on the property? If that's the case, insurance is, becomes a, a major issue um, that needs to be addressed. Um, the same thing with on-farm direct marketing. Are there gonna be any farm stands or pick your own? You see, when, when farms participate in certain activities where there are invitees or people from the public that are coming on the farm, there is just an increased liability that happens with uh, people falling and hurting themselves or cross-contamination, people not washing their hands. Um, these types of things are higher risk activities. And um, 
um, and logically on farm poultry slaughter would be a higher risk activity as well. So are any of these um, types of activities um, proscribed or prohibited? So with all that being in mind, I hope that the duties in the prohibition section can be drafted in a way that if your client, if your landlord client is really interested in becoming act, you know, actively engaged in farming for social security purposes, um, this, is where, this is where the draft swing comes in and really um, plays a role here in making sure that the landlord is involved in decision making and management. Um, and then finally, and this is the last slide on duties and prohibitions, will the tenant have any reporting requirements, right? So it, does the tenant need to get the landlord any information like grid sampling, yield monitor data, weigh wagon results, test plot results, soil tests, et cetera, the list could go on and on. Fertilizer, I mentioned this a little bit with the duties and prohibitions, but I really think the fertilizer uh, should, should definitely be addressed in one way or another within the farm lease. In my farm lease, I like to include a very simple boilerplate clause um, dealing with environmental law issues. I like to have the tenant promise to comply with federal, state, and local environmental laws. So think through with your client, what are the potential issues, um, duty to minimize certain activities that may cause environmental conservation. Are there any soil conservation provisions that should be included in the lease? And um, is there any concern that there are hazardous materials on the property? Those are some environmental issues to think through. Um, there is also um, environmental insurance. Um, I think that that's out of sight of the purview of this presentation, but the insurance webinar that I'm moderating on September of the 15th will briefly talk about environmental insurance and when it should be utilized. So I've talked before about FSA um, payments, so I just wanted to, to just briefly address that if applicable to the landlord and the tenant, federal farm programs should definitely be addressed in the farm lease. So here are some examples. Um, CRP payments, CSP payments, and direct and countercyclical um, permit payments. The lease should describe who will be receiving uh, the payments. Oftentimes, in a crop share or a hybrid scenario, the tenant will be the one who will be receiving the payments, and he or she or it, if it's in a business entity, should share um, those federal farm program payments with the landlord. If it's a cash rent, then it's usually the tenant is receiving them and not sharing with the landlord. The lease should also talk about default provisions. Okay, so there should be a list of actions that count as default in the terms of the lease, specifying whether part or all of the list of defaults can be cured or waived by the other party. What are the notice provisions? Okay, what needs to happen here? And you know, going back a little bit, I'm just trying to keep things simple for, for some of my clients. I don't really recommend that notice provisions need to be sent via you know, certified or registered mail. I mean, I think the notice provisions can oftentimes be simple, you know. Um, if there's a good working relationship, maybe you're going to hand deliver something or fax something or, you know, I don't love email because sometimes it can get stuck in spam, but don't try to get all lawyered up with a notice provision need needing to be sent to the attorney. You know, I think that we need to try to try to keep the notice provisions more simple. That said, you can certainly have um, certified mail or registered mail here in the notice provisions. Can the farm lease um, be assigned or sublease? State what conditions that can even happen. Okay, um, and what is the obligation of the farmer? So oftentimes my leases just say that it cannot be assigned or subleased without the written permission of the other party. So that's sort of the default unless the parties say otherwise. A few other le um, farm lease provisions. The landlord 
should have the right to enter the property. So the lease should describe when that should take place and in what circumstances. So for example, can the landlord enter the property to make a reasonable inspection? Just make sure everything is um, being kept up, uh, see if there's any problems. Second of all, can the landlord enter the property to make repairs? Maybe the landlord needs to come and repair a fence um, and make any installations, for example. Uh, can the landlord enter the premises to prospective buyers? You know, this is kind of a controversial thing to bring up to the tenant, but you know, the tenant understands that that person does not own the land and the landlord should be free to sell uh, or sh show the land to prospective buyers. Can the landlord come to the land to collect rent? Uh, hey, Farmer Joe, Farmer Jane, I'm here to collect your rent check. Can the landlord um, come by to do that? Can the landlord come by to deliver a notice to terminate the tenancy? Okay. Um, and then I think I mentioned this before with payment, but is there any security interest for the landlord um, if there are, are any payment um, issues. Like for example, I've seen that crops or livestock can be used as a security interest for the landlord. The lease should definitely discuss the termination procedures. Okay, like will there be a requirement for a notice of termination? What, how should that notice of termination be served on the other party? Um, please make sure when drafting this these provisions that you know obviously that it complies with this and uh, the law in your state um, the termination clause should also know any reimbursement or crop nutrients um, for crop nutrients lime etc um, for completed field work upon the termination of the lease um, in the in this section of the contract should also include the tenant's right if the property is transferred or condemned during the lease period and reimbursement provisions for a crop still in the ground when the lease is terminated. There are a whole slew of provisions I'm here in like the miscellaneous section, um, starting with confidentiality, which is in the, in the upper corner. I actually wrote an entire article on confidentiality agreements. It's on my JD Supra page. It's titled Maintaining Confidentiality for Your Farm or Agribusiness with Non Disclosure Agreements. So I prefer that a separate non disclosure agreement be executed between the, um, the farmer tenant and the landlord. Um, but if there's no NDA, then the farm lease itself could include a confidentiality clause. You know, saying that the terms of the agreement are going to be kept confidential, except for maybe the usual exceptions if ordered by a court, um, then they'll then they'll disclose that. A severability clause, which says that if one clause of the agreement is illegal or unenforceable, the rest of the agreement will be enforceable. I like to include an ADR, an alternative dispute resolution clause, because that's my style. I know that some lawyers will disagree with me on that, but I'm a trained mediator and I'm a believer in ADR, so I like to, to really have an ADR clause in my farm uh, leases. The choice of forum, uh, what, what court you're going to go to, the choice of law, which might seem straightforward, but maybe the landlord and the tenant are in different states or perhaps the farm property um, goes over, to, go, goes over uh, state lines. An indemnification clause in uh, some circumstance. Here's actually an important provision that's oftentimes overlooked. is a very simple clause that says the states the relationship of the party. Uh, importantly, this is a lease. Uh, there is no joint venture. There's no partnership. Okay, so even if they're effectively sharing pro profits with the crop share. This is why I think it's especially important to include that there's no joint venture uh, here. I've seen a lot of litigation arise because someone is claiming that they had a joint venture while the other one did not, and it can be solved very simply by including that provision. Um, intellectual property can also be discussed. 
And then finally, I prefer that the farm leases be notarized. It's not required, um, but I like it to be notarized. Um, one more thing on confidentiality agreements. I forgot to mention that on September 24th, I am doing another law line presentation uh, titled Protecting the Food and Agribusiness managing contracts, trademarks, and non-disclosure agreements. I'm actually going through all the different kinds of provisions that you'll find in a non-disclosure agreement and how it applies to agriculture. Um, I, I think that, that will be a nice presentation to complement uh, this presentation here today. A little bit more on ADR. Now when I include a provision of ADR in the contract itself, I like to always include an exception that in the, in the case of an emergency, somebody can still get to a courthouse. I think that that's important because ADR does not move quickly and sometimes you have to move quickly. Sometimes in New York, we, ha we call emergency motions in order to show cause. Sometimes you got to go to court with an order to, order to show cause. I like to have in my ADR clause, a three, three stages. One, a negotiation stage, where if a dispute arises, they're gonna try to work it out on their own. Maybe this will be for 14 days, two weeks. And then they'll move into the mediation. And mediation is non-binding, right? Like, they don't have to come to an agreement during the mediation stage. Um, now, I want to bring up that I think over 35 states around the country have an agriculture mediation program. New York is one of them. In fact, I'm a mediator that's on the panel for the New York State Agriculture Mediation Program. Okay, But as a caveat, these, um, these programs typically only mediate federal farm program disputes and also right to farm disputes. If you remember a few slides ago, we talked about right to farm. So those would be the types of uh, disputes that the, uh, that the state agriculture mediation program um, will mediate for free for the farmer, which is fantastic and is way underutilized. And I do suggest that program to my clients. Um, but they might not mediate farm lease disputes. So you need to investigate the agriculture mediation program in your state. Uh, you could just simply have a clause in there that they'll use a mediator who's knowledgeable on agriculture or farm leases um, that's uh, mutually agreed upon. Okay, so that's the type of mediation clause that I would include. And then I'd move into arbitration. I think if you're going to go as, um, that far to go and have an arbitration, that the arbitration needs to be binding, which means we are going to basically have a little miniature trial in front of this third party, the arbitrator, who's going to act like a judge and is going to make a decision. If you're going to go through that much effort, make the decision be binding. Um, and then are you going to use the rules of the American Arbitration Association? Where's the arbitration going to take place? So these are the types of uh, things that I like to cover in my ADR uh, clause in the farm lease. Some attorneys, some clients are totally against it. Uh, so there's different views of thought on this. On intellectual property, this issue can come up from time to time. One time I had a client that came to me and said, he, was, he or she was the tenant. Uh, he said, I'm going to be using the farm name of my landlord. Um, you know, they said it's okay, it's, we're going to use the farm lane, we're going to do business under that farm lane. Well, that is actually a license. That is a license to use their brand name, which is a trademark. Now, in this particular situation, the farm name was not registered, okay, but you don't need to be you don't need to have a registered trademark to have a trademark. Rinker Law PLLC is my brand name. It is not registered, but I still own the intellectual property of my own brand name, okay? So um, did, I'm just trying to think about uh, my family's farm, Rinker Simitals. That is um, my family's uh, trademark, okay? It is a common law trademark. So if somebody was going to come onto our property and be the tenant and do business as Rinker Simitals, I suggest in that situation that there be a separate agreement, 
separate than the farm lease for the, the license of that intellectual property. My parents would have the right during that time to still go and file a state trademark or they actually do business across state lines so they could file a federal trademark with the U.S. Patent and Trademark Office. They still own the right to that and the license uh, would go to the tenant for the, um, the term of the lease. A little bit about rent and price negotiation. So each side has the onus to look at the far market values in their areas. Oftentimes, the tenant is criticized of having more informational power. You know, per perhaps think about the landlord um, being a more experienced retired farmer, and the tenant is a younger farmer that doesn't have quite the capital to buy his or her own property. Um, you know, the, the, the tenant might be out going to lots of educational events. He or she is out in the community. So, so, so landlords are leery that the tenant has more informational power. But on the flip side, I've spoken on farm lease issues to tenants. And I have to tell you that tenants are very leery of landlords because they look at the landlords as the ones that can afford to pay for lawyers and um, that they have more bargaining power. So I think the, there's, you have to, to balance uh, who has uh, power in different areas. Um, but I have found that most landlords don't ask for rent increases when they could. And a question for the draftsman here is that should rent in the farm lease be indexed for inflation? And I guess the answer to that is, well, who are you working for? All right, so there are a lot of different variables that go into place here on, on what the rent should be, okay? So let's just start off with the value of the farm. I think that that is a good starting place on looking at that. And then look at comparable farm leases in the area. And that's literally what I tell my clients to do is please go talk to your neighbors. Go talk to your neighbor's neighbors. Get the, get the word around the community um, of what the um, what comparable farm leases um, do. Now, as an aside, um, sometimes I have farm leases that I draft where I represent both the landlord and the tenant. Wait, what, Carrie? This is a conflict. Okay, so sometimes my my farms actually come to me, and the operating farm is an LLC. Okay. And then there's another LLC, or maybe the land is in a trust, or maybe it's owned as a sole proprietorship, or whatever that is, two different business entities. And the farm lease will be between them, okay? I still ask my clients to go out and find out what comparable farm leases are because I want the farm lease to be at an arm's length transaction. So why would a farm set up um, two different business entities and have a farm lease between the two of them? Well, if the farming operation would get sued, the hope is, is that the business entity that owns the real property would be um, isolated if there was going to be an incident there. But back to, back to the value of the land. There are a lot of different issues that come into play, as I say here, a lot of different factors. How productive is the land? Is the tenant using the property at the most optimal or profitable use? Are, there, are the improvements helpful to the operation? Is there adequate water? Does the tenant need to bring in water? Um, has the property been adequately maintained? Um, on my outline that I have here included in the materials, on page 21, I talk about getting a fair price. And on page 23 in the outline, there are some links on where to find some more information on farm lease rates in Illinois, Iowa, Nebraska, and Kansas. Um, but I think uh, talking to the extension specialist in your area is also going to be a useful resource. So for example, here in uh, New York, uh, talking to a Cornell uh, cooperative extension person in Illinois, it'd be the University of Illinois uh, cooperative extension. All right, there are a lot of different other types of farm leases. Uh, oftentimes, tenants will come to me and they will also be leasing out the farmstead, um, either as the landlord or the tenant. 
And my suggestion is that the farmstead itself should actually be in a separate lease. When we're getting into the farmstead, we are now getting into a residential lease. Okay, so the laws governing residential leases do differ than farm leases. My suggestion is to just keep it completely separated. Uh, farm equipment leases uh, might be involved as well. A, a farm equipment lease might be for three to five years, um, for example, or maybe it's just going to be for the term of the, uh, the farm lease itself. But here again, my recommendation is to keep the farm equipment and machinery lease separate. Labor share leases, um, even custom farming agreements or other types of contracts. And uh, for the pig industry, there are manure application agreements. Uh, page 26 of my outline talks more about manure application agreements. For those of you that are interested in custom, custom farming agreements or custom hires, page 24 of my outline discusses about that. There are a lot of different kinds of livestock leases. Just today, um, I, I just read, recently wrote an article about bull leases. It was uh, published on my blog today and sent out through um, various cattle publications. And one cattle publication actually came back to me and asked me if I had ever written about semen contracts. So no, the answer to the question is no. I have not written about semen contracts, but I, I guess now I have an idea of another project to work on. But I have a lot of um, extensive information about bull leases that's on my JD Supra page. Um, a link to that is on my blog here today. But if, if there's a bull lease, I think it needs, needs to be a separate contract. Another type of lease might be with cows, stallion leases. Uh, we, we talked briefly about livestock share leases, another crop share, it's just the type, um, and grazing leases. These are different types of leases. There's some more information in the outline on these. Bull leases is going to be on pages 27 and 28, stallion leases on page 28, grazing leases on page 29 and 30, and Tiffany Dowell um, from Texas A&M. Um, speaks a lot on grazing leases. Um, I think that she might have an article or two that would be a good resource. As I mentioned at the very beginning of the presentation, I have found from my experience and also from the survey that I did that clients really like flat fees. I haven't mastered this on how to, to do this effectively, but I think that farm leases and these different types of leases like bull leases, farm machinery leases, that this is an ideal time for the attorney to try to do more of a flat fee. And you know, I recommend trying to streamline things with your practice, developing a questionnaire, using this outline and this presentation today as a guidepost of the different issues that need to be addressed within that client questionnaire. And of course, there are going to be different issues that come up here and again. And um, I recently read the book, Emeth Attorney. It was a great book. And it's got me thinking about developing checklists. And there's not going to be any one-size-fits-all um, with farm leases, but I think that that's a helpful tip from a practical standpoint, just to make sure that you think through all the issues and you talk about those issues with your client over the phone. We've only got a few minutes left. I just wanted to mention that on the first Friday of every month at 2 o'clock Eastern Time, you know, I talk to lawyers, law students, high schoolers, people of all ages that are interested in being an agricultural lawyer, you know, just let me know. We could talk via Skype or um, you know, via phone call as well. I also wrote a book. on. It's on New York food and agricultural law, but there are a lot of the chapters of the book that are applicable to people in other states. Um, and then it talks a little bit about New York and nuances. It's available on Amazon and Kindle. And I'm available pretty much anywhere on the internet. So, you know, here's my contact information. You can tweet me, you can Instagram me, find me on Facebook. I'm also available to consult other lawyers who, um, you know, want some guidance on, on farm leases. Thanks so much for your attention, and I hope that you will continue through the Law Line um, Agriculture Law Series. Thanks again.